what is good internet it is spirit of paradox here and welcome back to another video today we are going to be doing the second issue of the ultimates called big but before we start make sure you drop a like and if you are new to the channel subscribe if you are a fan of the ultimate universe we have got plenty more content coming down the road and also we are doing this too as a lead up to the upcoming event ultimate invasion where the ultimate universe will be making its return in full after secret wars 2015 but enough talk let's start the second issue of the ultimates big we start in modern day new york city with a deja vu with a destroyed harbor if you guys do not know this is actually the harbour that is in Ultimate Marvel Team Up issue number 3 and in Ultimate Origins. Across the river we see Nicholas Fury and Bruce Banner ordering food at a restaurant. Bruce orders his vegan meal and Nicholas Fury orders a steak. Fury also apologises to Bruce about the location and hopes it doesn't bring any bad memories about the Hulk. And Bruce Banner claims he hasn't had a second thought about the Hulk in days, when we know that's not true. He thinks about one of the images in his head when he was fighting Spider-Man as the Hulk. The reason for this meeting is to see if Bruce Banner is ready to come back and to work at S.H.I.E.L.D. again. Fury has his doubts, but Bruce reassures him that he is still 100% and is ready to work. He also explains how he's been taking pills to stay awake, because falling asleep feels too much like the Hulk. Even Bruce asks Nicholas, how is the job, don't you find it a little daunting? And in the most Samuel Jackson response ever, he's like, man, being the head of S.H.I.E.L.D. is like being the Pope, the Queen, and the pre President of the United States all rolled into one. Fury continues to flex and even explains how the people working in that diner are actually undercover agents. Even the food on the menu has been tested by bacterialists. And he also explains how all of his clothes were brought by the company and he has like a million dollar wardrobe. And all of his clothes are wiretapped so everything he does, everything he says and everywhere he goes is being monitored. Bruce is intrigued by the, the thought of side projects and asks such as... Fury responds with the super soldier program you've been working on for 8 years for example. For those who don't know what this 8 years is about, I highly recommend watching my ultimate origins playlist, but I'll go through it very briefly here. In this 8 year time period we're talking about is the beginning of when Bruce became the Hulk. So Nicholas Fury when he was younger came to Bruce and Hank Pym to reverse engineer his blood to recreate the super soldier serum. This would go very badly and Bruce Banner would use the super soldier serum information from Nicholas's blood and used it on himself creating the Hulk. And in that 8 year time period we see from Ultimate Marvel team up to Ultimate Origins and into Ultimate Spider-Man and in the Ultimates. So there is lots of connectivity when it comes down to the lore, even years before Ultimate Origins was even made. Fury continues with, what would you say if the president just authorized a $150 billion cash injection into your plans for the new Captain America, Doctor? Bruce replied with, I'd say you were lying, sir. Fury and Bruce would talk about the history with Captain America a little bit more. And Bruce would also bring up the fact that the last time they tried to recreate the Super Soldier Serum, it created the Jolly Green Giant inside of him. Bruce then asked the question, why would anyone in their right mind invest a nickel into the Super Soldier Serum, or Super Soldier Program, after what happened, happened in Chelsea Piers General? And the general explains, because we're living in crazy times, Doctor. Crime is becoming super crime. Terrorism is becoming super terrorism. Even the fattest and the most stupid politician on Capitol Hill realizes that the son of Star Wars is going to be useless against this kind of problems America is facing out there. So this is the reason why the Ultimates are needed. It's because due to the events of X-Men, Ultimate X-Men specifically, when Magneto 
launched an attack on the White House, that is when the whole world basically ex knew that they all needed to have their own super soldiers to go against super criminals. Bruce asked the question, are you serious about this? And Fury responded, with serious enough to be moving your people from that damp little squat in Pittsburgh to a brand new facility off 10 miles off the coast of Manhattan. George Jr. is talking to five state-sponsored super people to begin with, and I figure we need someone up there with a flag on his chest more than ever right now. Fury gives Bruce a document and he seems to be very happy. He states, this is unbelievable. Downsizing conventional numbers and reinventing a small superhuman unit for 21st century problems. This is everything I've ever scribed in all of those faxes General Ross used to ignore. I don't know what to say, sir. Nick Fury also states, Well, don't start nibbling my ear off just yet, my friend. Because of your recent health problems mean 12-digit budget comes with a very specific condition. And Bruce Banner responds with, which is, we're demoting you to number two. In the next page, we go to the Super Soldier Research Facility in Pittsburgh. And this is how we get to get introduced to Ultimate Wasp and Ultimate Giant Man. We see delivery men bringing boxes into a building and they're all covered in ants. In fact, the ants are all over the building when Janet Pym walks inside. Janet asks the question, am I losing my mind or are the insects helping with the removal, Jason? Jason responds with, I'm sorry, Mrs. Pym, but that information is classified. You'll have to ask your husband if you want to know about the details on the ants. So she goes into his laboratory and asks ants, and this is where we get to see Ultimate Giant Man controlling them in his lab. And he responds with, yeah, what do you think, Jan? Aren't they incredible? I've got two and a half million of them clearing out the lab and about 50,000 of them keeping everyone's hot drinks. They've even perfected coffee, he claims. Hank would then continue and explain how some of the ants fall into his coffee when they're adding cream and sugar. And then he would explain about how it works. It's a new form of military communication. I've been using pheromones instead of radio waves to issue instructions under enemy radar. And then human trials might still be a while away, but I'm pretty confident we're moving a few months from spiders. Janet would add on and say, you know you're definitely on a roll again, Hank. I don't think I've seen you this supercharged about work since you built that pacemaker for the cat. Hank would then go on and say, tell me about it. I don't know if all of these electrical storms we've been having lately, or just the fact that we're moving out of this dump. But the ideas for super people are coming to me faster than I can type these days, Jan. This giant man formula is practically writing itself. Janet would then speak about Bruce. I just wish that sweaty little Bruce guy wasn't coming back to spoil everything. And then Hank would respond with, don't worry about him, honey. Fury's keeping Banner busy on the other side of the complex with that Captain America serum he's been trying to crack for years. In the Ultimate Universe, some relationships are the same and some of them are different. The rest of the Ultimates don't really like Bruce as a whole, and especially with him having the Hulk. Loads of people talk a lot of crap behind his back, but never say it to his face, because they all know they would have gotten the same treatment her Kleiser got. That's coming by the end of the run, by the way. Hank continues to be a cunt and says the only time you'll see the guy is at Christmas and presidential visits. Janet would say, Oh, I'm not scared he's going to step on our toes or anything. It's just those rumours about where his funding was coming from during the departmental lean years. Do you think he was involved in the superhuman trials on civilians? You know, like, what's his name from breakfast the other day? Hank just looks baffled and says, who knows? Nobody at S.H.I.E.L.D. has a spotless record, he says. But I'm fairly sure Fury was being serious when he said he wanted to drag us out of the shadows. He continues, the superhero thing is supposed to be getting the biggest public relations push in human history, and the fact that Tony Stark's involved can only be a good sign, right? 
Tony Stark? Didn't you get the email? Apparently Mr. Clint of the Fortune so came down from a mountain and told Nick Fury he could have Iron Man for his nice new team. And then we skip over to Manhattan. We see Iron Man flying across the city and showing off as he's being surveillanced by Nick Fury and somebody else. Nick Fury would say, does he always show off like this when he takes the new suit out for a spin? Absolutely, General Fury. Sometimes I don't even think Tony Stark considers it a test run until he's waved at every office girl in the city. So if you guys were ever wondering where Tony Stark gets his cockiness from, he has got it in the 616 universe, but when you really think about Robert Downey Jr.'s depiction of Iron Man and his personality, the cockiness typically comes from the Ultimate Universe, mainly. But there has been cockiness in the 616, of course. In the next page, we see Iron Man flying down to his base, and he says this, Oh, don't believe a word of it, Nick. Our dear Mr. Hogan is perfectly aware I only stop and wave at the very, very pretty ones. Jarvis would say, Oh, here we go again. You heard correctly, Ultimate Jarvis is in the Ultimate Universe, and here, he is actually human instead of an artificial intelligence. But he says this, Overcompensating a little, aren't we, Master Tony? You know what they say about the Bachelor Boys, who feel the constant compulsion to remind us the insatiable ladies' men they are. Tony would respond with, Oh, shut up and stop giving me the creeps, Jarvis. You're supposed to be the perfect English butler, for God's sake. What happened to those vodkas and orange I asked for? Fury says, Vodka and orange at 10am, Stark? Not in Moscow, old boy. Cheers, by the way. Tony Stark and Nick Fury go for a walk and have a conversation. Okay, let's review this lineup S.H.I.E.L.D. is talking about. There's me, Pim, that poor wife he shrunk, and whatever marine we end up with once Bruce cracks the Captain America formula, correct? That's about the size of it, Tony. Tony Stark would talk about Branner and say this, couldn't we just lose Banner? I find it hard to put trust in someone who turned into a green Goliath and trashed Bridget Fonda's favourite patistry. Out of the question, Daddy-o, Fury says. The team needs a leader, and Bruce is still our best chance to turning a top US soldier into the new Captain America, my friend. What about this Thor guy over in Europe? Did you see that anti-corporate piece he did for 60 minutes a couple nights ago? He's wonderfully charismatic, but still not answering his mobile. Unfortunately, that said, with that hammer like that, I'd rather him be with us than against us, if you know what I mean. Tony would say, have you spoken to the Fantastic Four? And Fury would respond with, after all of the negative press they've been getting from their neighbours lately, don't even think about it, cowboy. The budgets we're making in the regular army is going to make us a political hot potato as it is. Why do you think I'm not risking any mutants in the initial lineup? They both walk into Tony Stark's office and he says this, Is that why you were so keen to get me on board? Do I bring a little rented respectability to this party, General? Never made a secret of it, Tony. You're a trusted brand in everything from internet software to polluted diet soda. And of course, this new Iron Man you've managed to devise in the mountains doesn't exactly hurt your case either. Like negativity thought, scramblers with a tracking system that could find a Democrat in Texas, this is everything S.H.I.E.L.D. boys ever fascinated about, man. Fury continues, the only thing we're losing sleep over right now is why you changed your mind sharing the Iron Man tech with my big, bad, military, industrial complex. You mean, besides the record-breaking contracts Stark International just secured? Fury responds, don't try telling me it was the contracts, Tony. Everyone and their mother knows you've got twice as much money as God. Why the 180 degrees? In all seriousness, I just, well, I guess I just hit a point in my life when I wondered what things could be like if all the billionaires and government spooks tried to save the world instead of bleeding it dry. Do you sense, do you, does this make any sense to you? And then Fury responds with, 
more than you'll ever know, Monopoly man. As Tony Stark is putting his clothes on, he says, Nicholas Fury, I believe this might be a beginning of a beautiful relationship. And then he gets a call. Sir, it's Pepper on the front desk. Your helicopter's waiting on the roof. We see Pepper Potts at the front desk giving Tony Stark his schedule for the day. And she says, afternoon schedule is lunch with the president, that takeover meeting with Marconi, and at 3pm is drinks with Miss Cameron Diaz. If you don't know who Cameron Diaz is, she is a famous Hollywood actress in real life, and she is also in the Ultimate Universe. Only as a reference though. Then Tony would respond to her by saying, Tell the pilot the elevator ride to the roof is 1 minute and 42 seconds, Pepper Darling. And then in the next panel we see Nick Fury say, You're a very, very strange individual, Master Stark. And he would respond with, Really? I hoped being worth 350 billion on paper might qualify me as eccentric, General Fury. In the next page, we go to the Triskelin Upper Bay, Manhattan, and we see a fighter jet flying past the Statue of Liberty. In the next panel, we see Janet Pym uh, greeting Dr. Bruce Banner and says, Nice to see you again, Dr. Banner. Would you like a hand with your luggage? It looks kind of heavy. No thank you, Mrs. Pym. I might not be the Hulk anymore, but I think I'm more than capable of carrying a few books and a laptop. Janet would say, suit yourself, but then she would ask more questions towards Bruce. So what do you think of the new facility? I know it's only half finished, but this is a million times better than the rat hole in Pittsburgh. Have you managed, how have you managed to work all of these years in that place without going nuts? I'll never know. You mean turning into a green rampaging monster through New York City doesn't qualify as going nuts anymore? Bruce would then clarify that this was a joke, and then Janet would say, uh, yeah, good one. Yeah, Bruce, this is the one woman you are never going to be able to smash. But anyway, oh yes, I almost forgot. I couldn't believe it when Nick Fury told me you were engaged to Betty Ross. Did you know she and I used to rent a room together back in NYU before she switched to Berkeley for the communications degree? You see, this is, I just feel so sorry for Bruce because you could just tell he is not happy with this conversation. God, I haven't seen Betty since they released all of those special editions of Star Wars movies. I can't believe Fury's hired her as the director of communications. Bruce would respond, to be honest, we haven't been a couple in quite some time, Mrs. Pym. Betty bought one of those stupid self-analysis books a few months ago and decided I was a toxic influence. Last time I saw her, she moved into Shoho and dyed her hair pink, oh god, and then suggested she was temporarily in a relationship break for six months. Really? I can't imagine why. Like, why is everybody such a dick to Bruce? Like, and you wonder why he does what he does in issue number five. In the next page, we see Bruce not looking happy with a message saying this. Hey Bruce, I'm sorry I couldn't meet you at the helicopter, but these workaholics have been prepping me for the Giant Man trials all morning. As I said, Bruce is not looking happy right now, at all. Somebody in the room says, yeah right, like we were going to make any of the decisions around here. Good to see you're back on your feet again, Dr. Banner. In the chamber, we see people prepping Giant Man, and he says, Let's hope you're luckier than I was with Captain America, Dr. Pym. I suppose your biggest concern with something like this would be everything growing at the same speed, huh? Oh, I've got the bi biology work down to the tenth decimal point. I'm just worried if I'll stop growing before I hit the critical 60 feet mark. Bruce would ask, why? What's the significance of that? And Janet would respond in a very bitchy way. 60 feet is the exact height which the human skeleton can no longer support its body mass, Doctor. The big baby of mine is worried that his thigh bones are going to snap, even though I've told him a million times that stopping will be auto re automatic reflex. What do you think keeps me from shrinking smaller than an inch, honey? 
Our neurology won't let us change to the size to the point where the body is in danger. She continues, well it's time to put our pillow talk to the test sweetheart. And then in the next page we see, everybody starts leaving the area as somebody on the microphone says, testing begins in T minus 10 seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, clear the area please. Then Jason would say, no sign of any psychological changes yet anyway. Janet would say, patience is a virtue Jason, give him time. And then we start to see Hanman, or Hank I should say, start to grow in size and the very clothes he's wearing is starting to tear. He shouts, oh my god, and then somebody over the radio says, don't be scared honey, just remember this is exactly what you wanted to happen. And then he says, no, there's something wrong here, Jan. Everything is shrinking instead of getting bigger. No, everything's fine, Hank. It's your perceptions are changing. Close your eyes if you're scared. And then once he does this, all of the lights in the area start to go out and explode. And then he shouts, Jan, what happened to the lights? Nothing to worry about, honey. Just a little technical glitch support. Shut down the power all along tracks 47 and 48 and hit the floor lights, please. Hank starts to panic and starts shouting, Oh my God, oh my God, I'm turning inside out, Jan. Stop the experiment, I'm turning inside out. Janet starts to panic and starts shouting and says, What are you waiting for, you numbskull? Hit the blasted lights. When he does that, everybody in the room is awestruck by the new discovery of giant man's experiment going well and he says got you suckers janet rejoices and then says i'm gonna kick your butt hank pym somebody states the size of giant man and he claims that he is about nine, uh, 59 feet and 11 and a half inches way to go dr pym jason would ask bruce on the scale of one to ten how much did that rock Bruce reluctantly says, oh, 10, definitely 10. And then we see the Hulk in his mind, looking angry, and same with Bruce. Uh-huh, he says, and with his facial expression, he isn't happy at all. In the next page, we go to Dr. Banner's quarters, and he is talking to Nick Fury on the phone. Bruce would ask Fury, how do you think I'm doing, General? Hank Pym is swaggering around calling himself Giant Man and I'm sitting here with a bottle of wine scribbling useless equations all over a full scap pad. And I, why am I letting this guy walk all over me like this? He's going to end up creating a whole blasted team if I don't crack this idiotic super soldier formula soon. And why can't I open my mouth to these people without coming off as a complete and utter? And then he would get interrupted and state, Excuse me, General? I said shut up and open that bottle of champagne you've been saving for the next season of Star Trek, Dr. Banner. The answer to your prayers has just been answered. You're not going to believe what they just fished out of the Atlantic Ocean. Then we see a defrosting ultimate Captain America to be continued. Yes, everyone. That was issue number two of The Ultimates. And I've got to say, man, this one was long to edit because there was a lot of universe building in this issue. Building up the lore, building up the characters, explaining who they are, explaining how their personalities are like and, and their, how their powers work as well. So I've definitely got to say this was a very good issue and I highly recommend issue number two of The Ultimates. So let me know what you guys think in the comments below. How did you guys think about this video? Any way I can improve? Anything that are good? Anything that are bad? You know what to do. If you guys enjoyed the story, make sure you drop a like. If you are new to the channel, make sure you drop a subscribe. A, we are going to be covering the Ultimate Universe up until... Well, not up until, I should say. We're going to be doing Ultimate Universe content... Uh, leading to Ultimate Invasion this June 21st and I will also be doing a breakdown of that entire event as well. We are going to be putting some other Ultimate content on the channel so make sure you stay tuned. Thank you, what, thank you very much for watching this video and thank you for all of your continued support. Have a nice day and I will see you in the next one.